evening, everybody. My name is Marie Kilduff, and I'm the Interim Director of the National Clinical Leadership Centre for Nursing and Midwifery, otherwise known as the NCLC. The NCLC comes under the Office of the Nursing and Midwifery Services Director in the HSC. Our function is to support clinical leadership development of nurses and midwives nationally. Over the past six months, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been working with nurses and midwives nationally in supporting them with their clinical leadership development. During this time, the team and I have been struck by the significant clinical leadership that has been demonstrated by our nursing and midwifery colleagues. We really wanted to provide an opportunity for our colleagues to share their stories, not only to support them, but also to share their learning which could positively enhance other services nationally. In order to make this happen, the NCLC have come together with our colleagues in the Chief Nursing Office, Department of Health, and the Institute of Leadership, Royal College of Surgeons, Ireland, to present this webinar series. This webinar series will consist of nine webinars, which will be presented every two weeks between now and February 2021 with a break over the Christmas season. During that time, we will hear from nurses and midwives nationally of all grades and all nursing disciplines. On behalf of the CNO's office, the NCLC and the institutional leadership, I'm absolutely delighted to launch this webinar series with our first webinar this evening, entitled Nursing and Midwifery Clinical Leadership During COVID-19 sharing the learning from our senior leaders. I'm delighted to introduce our expert panel, which consists of Dr. Geraldine Shaw, Nursing and Midwifery Services Director and Assistant National Director, and Ms. Rachel Kenna, who is our Chief Nursing Officer in the Department of Health. You're both extremely welcome here this evening, and I'm delighted that you've taken the time to join us about 30 minutes and during that time I will be posing questions to both Ger and Rachel and the time will be divided equally between both of our senior leaders. I'd also like to welcome Dr Claire Lewis, Deputy Chief Nursing Officer from the Department of Health and Claire has been supporting me in developing and presenting these webinars and will be during the course of the webinar series. Claire this evening has, will be taking notes during the webinar and will present the key points raised at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to start with yourself first, Ger. You're very, very welcome here this evening and it's lovely to see you there. And thank you for taking the time to join us. Ger, from our discussions earlier on, we were just saying that you started in post in January 2020 as the Director of the Nursing and Midwifery Services. And I suppose I was just struck that two months later, you were, we were all in the midst of a, pan, a global pandemic and nobody saw it coming. How did you and the ONMSD you know, manage this evolving crisis? Because it was such a challenging time. Yes. Uh, thanks, Marie. And I'm delighted to be part of the webinar. And yes, you're absolutely right. It has been an unprecedented year by any term. I was very fortunate that I was surrounded by an experienced, competent and very willing team from the CNMEs, the NMPDUs, the Leadership Centre and the ONMSD leadership team. Now, although the, the pandemic and the situation was new and unknown, uh, we as a team didn't want to take a let's wait and see approach. We wanted to get ourselves into a position of preparedness as soon as possible in order that we would be able to respond to the COVID-19 HSE and service imperatives. So we quickly um, set about developing an order and direction of our work. Uh, we had to look at our own work and we categorised that into what was critical uh, to continue alongside COVID or that which could be delayed to a later date. This meant then that we were uh, available and able to respond to uh, COVID specific uh, issues, both at a local and national level. And alongside that as well, the ONMSD and its hub and spoke structure, uh, connecting corporate to frontline, meant that we were able to support the CCO's office, HSC management, 
uh, service senior nursing and midwifery colleagues and staff on the front line, as well as linking externally with the CNO's office, the NMBI and the HEI. And collectively, we maintained relationships throughout that time in order to um, successfully deliver on the outcomes in managing COVID. Chair, thank you for providing a comprehensive overview of of how the ONMSD and yourself responded to this evolving crisis. I suppose as I'm listening to you there, I'm just really interested. It was such a proactive approach that you all took. Um, It would be lovely for our listeners to hear some of the examples from how you responded yourself on the ONMSD team um, to, to the evolving situation. Yeah, thanks, Marie. Well, there's there's many, many examples that I could quote, but just to give a general flair across a few areas. So the CNMEs, the NMPUs and the Leadership Centre uh, developed new programmes of education and training and new platforms of delivery. Uh, for example, in the first three months of the pandemic, the CNMEs had delivered COVID education to 21,000 staff across the acute and community. Um, There was 11 new online education resources developed and made available to all staff. We also supported the education and upskilling of a thousand nurses that were redeployed to support the ICU surge. We supported workforce generation, which was obviously critical during that time to support nursing midwifery colleagues in the front line. And one of the initiatives there was the, um, the hiring of students to work as healthcare assistants. And we, along with the CNO's office, then negotiated with NMBI that those students would be accredited for some of that work that would go towards their training and uh, an ongoing education. Uh, In the ONMSD, through our leads and collectively, we supported the services across the community. So public health nursing, ID, mental health and uh, older persons by setting up networks of support, you know, WhatsApp groups, databases for questions and answers, frequent teleconferences. And that was done uh, to support them in in helping to deal with issues as they arose. Uh, We also led and supported the implementation of telehealth initiatives to support nursing and midwifery uh, practice in different ways now that we're in a pandemic situation. And finally, the ONMSD staff themselves on a, on a personal basis and professional basis voluntarily uh, volunteered to redeploy to frontline services, to testing and contact tracing centres, uh, community assessment hubs and triage and helplines, just by some examples for you, Marie. Jer, thank you very much. And as I'm listening to you there, I'm just really struck by the significant amount that was done in such a short period of time. So thank you for providing those examples of the senior leadership that was demonstrated during this time. Um, Jer, I suppose leadership styles is something that we talk about a lot in the Leadership Centre. And when we're working with staff on our programmes, our initiatives, we always look towards leadership styles and get people to reflect on them. I know that during the COVID-19 period, and we're still seeing it, Sometimes leaders have to change their style to adapt and respond as situations arise. And I'm interested to know, Ger, what leadership style did you demonstrate and are continuing to demonstrate during this global pandemic? Well, I certainly had to wear uh, a few hats like many leaders do at different times. So uh, certainly during this time and generally speaking, I adopt a transformational leadership style And that is which is working with the team, identifying the changes that are needed and then working together to execute those changes Uh, from a situational leadership point of view, which is the other style I adopted along with the team was we had to be able to um, adjust and adapt. The situation was changing on an ongoing basis, so we had to adapt and be flexible along with that. Uh, Additionally, compassionate leadership which was very important during this time. It's important any time, but especially during these last six months. This was a difficult time for people personally, in their own lives and professionally. And it was very important to recognise that and to support staff to be empathetic and to work with them in uh, in helping them uh, through that anxiety in those difficult times. Thank you, Jer. And 
you know, as you mentioned, compassionate leadership there, in addition to the other styles, I think it's it's a style that's definitely being used a lot more, especially in the last six months. And it's actually really good to see that because the outcomes are so good from, from a compassionate leadership approach. Chair, um, I'm just interested in relation to the term change. And I mean, we've seen so much change with COVID-19. It's a word that goes hand in hand with the pandemic. Um, what I'm really interested to know, Chair, is what changes have you seen from a nursing and midwifery perspective during the last six months? Um, there are many, many changes that I could quote, Marie. And I have to say that nurses and midwives really um, stood up to the plate and they absolutely showed uh, tremendous resilience over the last six months and embracing all sorts of change and supporting the service. Uh, I'll just pick one or two that stand out to me, and that is the utilisation of digital health and how nurses and midwives have embraced those platforms in delivering practice and patient care in different ways through you know, nurse AMP-led virtual clinics, uh, antenatal classes in midwifery. Uh, another standout for me over the last six months is that how the professions have worked together in an integrated way. So we've seen integration both from multidisciplines working together, but also integration across uh, community and acute during these last six months. So that has been really stand out and, and really important. And obviously, it fits very well with slaughter care, and it is slaughter care in action. So, as I say, I could pick, pick a lot of things, but those are some examples of really stand out pieces. Thank you, Ger, and it's it's really interesting to hear the, those key examples that you've identified. Um, you know, a lot of what's happened in the last few months, we were planning some of those initiatives anyway for for our professions, but in some ways, they've almost um, our our plans have been accelerated. And I'm just thinking of the future for nursing and midwifery. You know, as a senior leader, I know your role would always be to be thinking strategically, future planning, etc. And I just like to know, like, how do you feel that COVID-19 will impact on the future of nursing and midwifery professionals going forward? I think um, amongst the learning from this, Marie, is that um, you know, um, digital health uh, has been utilised quite a lot in the last six months, and that is something that I see uh, continuing into the future as a core part now of nursing and midwifery in terms of uh, enabling practice. So I see digital health and e-health uh, remaining. I also um, see the use of virtual platforms as being a core part of how we deliver education and training going forward. You know, we've learned a lot during the last six months. We're still learning. We're still trying to meander around all of those virtual worlds across the board. So those are pieces that I see staying. And as I said earlier as well, in relation to how in an integrated way professions have worked together, how in an integrated way services across acute and community have worked together, how we've seen that and how we've seen Sloan Care in action over the last six months. So obviously Sloan Care is our health policy now. So I think there's a great foundation there already over the last six months, which you know can be maintained and developed as we go forward. I've also seen over the last six months um, leadership at every level. We've often said that leadership is not about a title. You don't have to have a a senior position title to be a leader and I've certainly seen over the last six months leadership at every level from the front line right the way through all of the different grades and divisions of nursing and you know that is something that is to you know to be built on and to further develop you know leadership for the future. Thank you, Chair. And as we all know, this is the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife 2020. And I know both yourself and Rachel gave key messages on the International Day of the Nurse and the International Day of the Midwife in May. And I suppose this is three months later, and I know at that time both of you were extremely encouraging and supportive of our nurses and midwives who were listening to your messages at such a difficult time. We're now in a situation where numbers are rising again, and we're all a little bit cautious as to what the following few months are going to bring. So I suppose as Director of the Nursing and Midwifery Services, Chair, this is an opportunity to present another message to people who are listening, um, for, to our nurses and midwives. And I'm just wondering, have you any message you'd like to give to our listeners? Um, 
Marie and the staff during this time have done a tremendous work and you know I want to thank again uh, all the nurses and uh, midwives across every grade and different strands of our professions and um, the student nurses and the student midwives and our healthcare assistants for the fantastic work or which they do on an ongoing basis and especially over the last six months and continuing today. Um, it is down to that tremendous work that we have helped flatten the curve in, in relation to Ireland and that we've been able to help our citizens and help our patients in providing safe and quality patient care. I also want to, you know, at this time as well, you know, remember with great sadness um, healthcare staff that have lost their lives over the last six months. And I, and I want to extend the sympathies, you know, from myself and the UNMSD uh, and the nursing and midwifery profession uh, to those loved ones of those, and they will not be forgotten. Finally, uh, Marie, um, this is the year of the nurse and the midwife, and, you know, I think it would be fitting for me to perhaps end on a, a word of wisdom from Florence Nightingale herself and a message from her which, which I concur with. So I'll just read it out to you if that's okay. So uh, Florence said, never lose an opportunity of urging a practical beginning, however small, for it is wonderful how often in such small matters the mustard seed germinates and roots itself to grow. And I guess in our world of nursing and midwifery, we would call that small tests of change and scaling up. And that's how we make a difference. Chair, thank you so much. I think that's such an encouraging message to our colleagues who are listening. And um, yes, it has been extremely challenging and we do need to remember the people that have lost their lives and their families. Um, thank you so much for your overview and for your comprehensive answers. And it's been wonderful to hear and to see an insight of how your journey has been in the last few months. Thank Without you. further ado, I'm going to turn to Rachel now. Rachel, you're extremely welcome. Rachel, I'm just conscious that, like Jer, you were new to post as well. And in fact, you started your new role in April, which was in the midst of the global pandemic. And again, I'm sure our listeners, I'm also very interested to know, how did you and the CNO team respond to the evolving crisis? Um, thank you, Marie. Yes, and I did take a post in the middle or in the midst of the initial stages of this pandemic. So some would say I knew what I was getting into, but I don't think anybody knew really what we were um, facing into. New chief nursing officer then, I suppose, Firstly, to say it's a privilege to be able to provide that level of leadership to nursing and midwifery at a time like this. Um, and it has been a very challenging time for everybody. And as chief nursing officer, I suppose it was my responsibility to lead the team here in the Department of Health to work collaboratively across government and across the health services to make sure that nursing and midwifery was able to respond to the needs of the population at a time like this. Um, and we looked at things like, and I know Ger has referred to some of them, um, the workforce and particularly the student workforces, um, working with our regulation body to make sure that um, all the barriers were moved so that we could increase the necessary capacity of the professions in order to be able to respond. My role in particular was to make sure that the correct allocation of resources was in place to ensure that there was no delay and there was no barriers to all of this. Um, and also then I would have particularly worked very closely with NEFET here in the department and the Minister for Health at the time um, to make sure that nursing solutions were both known to NEFET um, and also then to make sure that recommendations for NEFET were able to be mobilised through the nursing and midwifery workforce um, and make sure that we could respond at this time of crisis. Um, I worked very closely with my colleagues Jura Shaw and in the ONMSD to make sure that the services and the policy direction were very much connected but also from my perspective as Chief Nursing Officer, um, 
I have huge contacts with my international colleagues. So I worked very closely with my counterpart in Northern Ireland, Charlotte McCardle, um, in her capacity as chief nurse, and also had regular contact with chief nursing colleagues in England, Scotland and Wales, um, where we were sharing the same experiences and challenges. And it was really good to be able to collaborate and network um, in terms of making sure that we were maximising the responses for the Irish context um, and sharing our results and crises, etc., with them as well, because we were all going through the same thing. So that was a really important connection. Um, and then I suppose on reflection, um, I think probably it was being able to access that system to influence where we were going and the direction was needed at the pace that it was needed. Thank you, Rachel. I think it's great to be able to hear and get an insight into both yourself and Jira's roles and the influence you both have in terms of what's happening in nursing and midwifery nationally and, you know, the, the actual advocacy role that you have as well. Collaboration is key. I think, you know, we're in a situation that's unprecedented for all of us, collaboration and supporting each other. And I really hear that from both of you. It's learning from each other and, you know, to recognise that at times you do have to ask where do I go here and to support others in terms of, of supporting them when they're a little bit lost as to what direction to take. So it's really lovely to hear that collaboration. And it's really, really um, important as well. Um, so I suppose, Rachel, I'm just thinking you did come into post during the pandemic. So as you said yourself, you knew what you were getting yourself into. What I'm interested in, because I'm sure your vision at the time, you know, the pandemic was impacting a little bit on your vision. And what I'm interested to ask could you tell us how your role and the CNO office, you know, how you're going to support the vision for the future direction of nursing and midwifery, given that we're in the midst of a global pandemic? Um, yeah, sure. I'd be delighted to. So the pandemic, although very challenging, has brought about significant changes for how we access and deliver care. It has created an environment for integration, new ways of working and innovation. Um, and we got to this space really, really quickly. Um, I very much now see the role as the chief nursing officer is central in supporting this um, through policy um, and practice to make sure that patients and families are, remain at the heart of what we do, but that we are in a position to be able to provide uh, flexible pathways for nurses and midwives um, to keep progressing. The Chief Nursing Officer will have significant responsibility then for designing policy solutions in line with Slauncher Care and other government priorities as we emerge from this crisis um, and embark on the reform that is needed and the reform that has actually started. Uh, the role of nurses and midwives, as we know, and it has been very, very visible, are, is essential to our health services um, and the response to the global pandemic from both professions has been outstanding. For me personally, as Chief Nurse Officer, I have learned so much from engaging very closely with frontline nurses and midwives throughout this, um, and that has influenced my thinking in terms of the vision. So I think probably across four key areas now, my vision for the professions includes how do we mobilise innovation? How do we encourage and achieve integration? Um, our response from the, the community and across the community shows that we need to reach out to be wider than just health care, that patients need an awful lot more and that nursing and midwifery are the key to be able to mobilise that. Um, and that nursing and midwifery um, skill mix and staffing resources are key to be able to be in a position to continue to provide high quality care and safe care um, while in order in enabling us to work to the top of our license as well. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think you've presented very clearly there your vision and actually what's really great is we can see clearly your, the way you're, how you're going to do this with those four key priorities. Um, also, I think it's great for nurses and midwives who are listening and they're going to be reassured that actually a lot of what yourself and Jer are doing comes from engagement with staff and they do influence what happens at a very senior level. So that's reassuring for, for nursing and midwifery professions. Um, I suppose I'm interested, Rachel, as you're speaking there in really, I suppose, as you talk about the response to the CNO office, could you provide us with some examples of, of how you actually responded to COVID-19 and how we could actually embed these into the future direction of nursing and midwifery? 
Um, yeah, got, there's so many that, that I could pick from, but maybe I'll just pick a couple that will demonstrate, I suppose, how we're going to be able to incorporate them into the vision um, of the future for the professions. So, I mean, looking across the system and what happened um, and the extensive outreach services that occurred, which meant that nursing and midwifery were able to stretch out into areas of care that we would never have been able to work with before. This was leveraged through technology, really, um, but also through our great flexibility in terms of how we can actually deliver care, the creativity and the innovation that went with it. So I suppose for my vision then to integrate outreach models of care with community services using technology will be key of what that is going to help us to be able to do. And my job then will be to build policy around maximising um, the t technology delivered care solutions for patients. Um, something else then, Marie, I suppose, just to, to focus on is um, building upon the rapid response models that we've seen were so necessary in responding to the crisis of the pandemic. Um, so increasing coverage across regions and improving health and well-being. So focus on every aspect of care delivery, using the models that perhaps then flexed up to be able to be in a position to respond um, when the, in the crisis came and in the time of the crisis. Thank you, Rachel, um, and for providing those examples, which give us an insight into, into the actual um, future of, of nursing and midwifery and how COVID is impacting on that. Can I ask you, Rachel, um, what do you feel were the key elements required that supported the level of responsiveness and mobilisation of nursing and midwifery services that we have seen during the crisis? Um, thanks, Marie. That's a great question. And I think probably there's a number of key elements that, you know, if they weren't working together, we wouldn't have been able to achieve such a response. So from my perspective, what I've seen is was key to be able to understand and influence the response was robust data. Um, both reporting of what we had achieved, being able to see what was required, being able to respond to it and looking at um, the outcomes at a, at a level of, of working within a crisis as much as you can. But it was key to our response. The other thing was strong leadership. I think what I saw from every level, and there's already referred to it, leadership didn't mean a position. It was the people that were in and through the service. Um, and I saw them step up and perform at a really, really um, senior level across every um, aspect of care that we delivered. Integration was key, working together, not only just for myself in the chief nursing office with other senior leaders across the country, but at local level on the ground, the level of integration that we saw from people was phenomenal. Clear governance structures helped to be able to sort of mobilise services really, really quickly and keep everybody safe clear roles and responsibilities. That's one of our key factors within nursing and midwifery that we have very clear roles and responsibilities and everybody knew what they were supposed to be doing, what they should be doing and they went that little bit further as well. I think standardisation of processes helped to identify need and also for us to be able to respond um, and support, supporting the environment of creativity, innovation. So allowing people to talk, practice to the top of their licence and supporting that safely um, I think was key in the crisis response. Thank you, Rachel. And as I'm listening to you there, I mean, the theme of this webinar series is sharing the learning. And I think there's huge learning in what you've actually presented there for all of us at all levels of, of in our roles in terms of supporting nursing and midwifery going forward. So thank you for that. Um, Rachel, we have a new government, as you know, obviously, um, that commenced their term in office and they have clearly identified that Slauncha Care is one of their key priorities for healthcare. And as we know, that's going to continue for some time. I'm interested to know, Rachel, how do you envisage your role as the CNO and the CNO's office supporting Slauncha Care implementation, but also at the same time responding to the care needs of the population during the pandemic? Um, again, Marie, that's a fantastic question. And from my perspective, one of the benefits of Ireland's position for their chief nursing officer. So my role is that it is centrally positioned, very close to the minister um, and to the government in terms of being able to influence from a nursing and widow here perspective. Um, that's not something every country has. In fact, very few have. So we are first and foremost in a very key position to be able to sort of direct the future travel um, in terms of policy development. So my particular role as chief nursing officer then is to work across the department 
with my colleagues in here to work across the services and then to work and bring the government priorities to the fore. Um, and delivering Solange Care means for us, as we know, bringing care closer to home ensuring that policy enables this and supports nurses and midwives to be able to innovate and practice to the top of their license. Now that might sound easy but it isn't and what it's going to have to incorporate is um, very innovative and creative delivering care and one of these areas that we're working on at the moment with my colleague um, Dr Claire Lewis who is my Deputy Chief Nursing Officer here in the department is a community virtual ward. Now again this is a collaborative project with um, um, Margaret from Jura's team as well, where we're providing hospital care in the, in the home setting um, and includes integrating acute and community services. So it is right down the road of Slaunchy Care. And this is just one example of how we're going to bring the needs of the population together with delivering reform required under Slaunchy Care. And it's no easy task. So Marie, the things that we will have to focus on again is integration of care, technology enabled programs to support patients in their own home, patient empowerment and engagement, so a lot of support structures, care management, chronic disease management, and getting the patients involved in their own care an awful lot more. Supporting the shift of care into the community, um, and that's something that, you know, it's going to take an awful lot of time, but I think um, responding to the, the care needs of the population in the pandemic has really begun that process for us. So we need to improve capacity and access through senior nursing clinical leadership out there. And then, of course, we're going to need the education and create things like credentialing pathways to ensure that we have that flexible and responsive um, approach to education that will support the nurses and midwives to be able to continue to develop. Rachel, thank you very much for that. Um, it's wonderful for all our listeners to hear um, what you're saying from both yourself and Jair in terms of what's happening and what's going to happen into the future, particularly in relation to slow and care, because it is something that we really do need to focus on. And, and it obviously will have optimal outcomes for patients and service users. Rachel, my final question to, to you is the same question I asked Jair, because like Jair, you did give a key message to our nurses and midwives on the International Day of the Nurse and the International Day of the Midwife. You know, again, it's just we're in, in a different time now, three months on, and it's just an opportunity for you to speak to our listeners and to give them a message from our Chief Nursing Officer in the Department of Health. Many thanks again, Marie. And first and foremost, I would like to thank all the nurses and midwives for their calm uh, response and unwavering commitment and the many personal sacrifices that they have made during this pandemic. Um, in fast moving and uncertain times, nursing and midwifery professions have continued to evolve and respond to what has been really, really complex situations. In order to support this, it is important that we now take the opportunity to reflect on what has been achieved to shape and inform the future direction of nursing and midwifery across areas such as working across boundaries that we've never worked before, how to provide access and coverage for patients and families, to leverage technology and work with it, enable us to do our jobs better um, and at a much higher level, to be proactive with communities to address unmet needs, to influence and provide support to all of the citizens and organisations and linking us all together. And of course, to build resilience in for complex professions, nursing and midwifery um, isn't easy. So I think the road ahead of us is challenging, um, but it's also an opportunity and very exciting times for us to be able to continue to evolve. And just to know that I will um, very much look forward to working with everybody across the system. And if I could be so cheeky as to add in uh, for everybody to remember to get their flu vaccine this year, please. We need you on the front lines. We know what you can do. Um, and I, for one, are very proud to hold the position that I do. Uh, being the head of both professions, nursing and midwifery. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Rachel. And I think it's it's a real sign of a leader when they take the opportunity to, to actually ask people to, to do what, what you're hoping they will do with the flu vaccine. So at this stage, I'm just, I'd really like to welcome my colleague, Dr. Claire Lewis, who, as I said earlier, is the Deputy Chief Nursing Office from the Department 
officer from the Department of Health. And Claire has been busy writing notes during this webinar. And Claire's role this evening is to present the key points that have been um, raised during the last while. So um, thank you, Marie. And um, our speakers have eloquently highlighted several key points through their lived experiences of leading and responding to COVID and subsequently planning for the future. What was very clear was the importance of policy, regulation, legislation in order to lead effectively and efficiently and support mobilization of services, mobility of nursing and midwifery, and increase in capacity and access, and support in the delivery of salutary care. The importance of strong governance and strong leadership, and support in educationally and clinically both staff to be able and patients to be able to respond to the needs of patients during COVID, but also in planning for the future. And the importance of robust methodologies for safe staffing and skill mix in responding to the needs of patients, and that's irrespective of their healthcare setting. And having clarity on roles and responsibilities across nursing and midwifery at a national, regional, and local level, and the true impact of um, true integration in improving access, capacity and coverage. And this is not just at a national level, but a regional and local level. And the power of innovation, that was very, very clear. Um, we got to a space very quickly and it was through new ways of working and through collaboration, but also how we leverage the technology. Um, and so in terms of responding to COVID, this will positive impact on how we deliver slanter care into the future and enable a nursing and midwifery to progress and develop and improve access and coverage. But also what was very, very clear was the importance of compassionate leadership and building resilience so we can adapt and prosper in agile healthcare systems. So just to conclude, the building blocks for the future of nursing and midwifery that both Ajay and Rachel eloquently highlighted was the importance of strong leadership and governance, integration, innovation to nursing and midwifery to develop, to support service delivery and education, and having robust data and robust methodologies for safe staffing and skill mix. And I would just like to thank again the speakers for sharing their journey and vision. Um, it was uh, really, really interesting. And, and as Rachel and Jerbo said, exciting times ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. I think that was an excellent summary of the points that were raised, and it really highlights the significant learning that has been made available. I think this evening on this during this webinar, um, from our and from hearing from our senior leaders. So thank you so much, and I look forward to continually working with you on during this webinar series. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to once again thank our senior leaders and our expert panelists, Rachel and Jer, for taking the time to present today and also for coming here and for actually taking part in our webinar and for supporting the initiative. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Marie, and, uh, and just to uh, thank Rachel as well and uh, from my perspective and the OMSD to thank Rachel for her support uh, during this time and uh, our two departments and both ourselves have collaborated very much um, uh, professionally and I think that kind of relationship has been key to actually helping us all meander through this journey and we've done that in collaboration with our service colleagues across nursing and midwifery and that has been one of the successful um, aspects of this as well. Not everything we do is always you know seen and tangible and it's often that relationship and networking behind the scenes, actually, which helps to move us forward. So thanks very much to Rachel and our colleagues in the department. Um, yes, thanks, Marie. And as I said earlier, I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to take part in the webinar. And I think it's really, really important just to acknowledge there what you said and suppose just to reflect, for reflecting on it. Um, I don't think I would have got through the last three months if it hadn't have been for the collaboration and support I got from Jer and our team in the ONMSD. And it's that type of collaboration and working together that made us stronger and be in a better position to be able to respond to the crisis um, in what has been a really, really difficult time for everybody. So thank you. Our next webinar will be nursing and midwifery clinical leadership during COVID-19, sharing the learning from older person services. And we look forward to you joining us for that webinar. Thank you.
to once again thank our senior leaders and our expert panellists, Rachel and Jer, for taking the time to present today and also for coming here and for actually taking part in our webinar and for supporting the initiative. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Marie, and, uh, and just to uh, thank Rachel as well, and uh, from my perspective and the ONSD, to thank Rachel for her support uh, during this time, and uh, our two departments and both ourselves have collaborated very much um, uh, professionally, and I think that kind of relationship has been key to actually helping us all meander through this journey. And we've done that in collaboration with our service colleagues across nursing and midwifery. And that has been one of the successful um, aspects of this as well. Not everything we do is always you know, seen and tangible. And it's often that relationship and networking behind the scenes actually, which helps to move us forward. So thanks very much to Rachel and our colleagues in the department. Um, yes, thanks, Marie. And as I said earlier, I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to take part in the webinar. And I think it's really, really important just to acknowledge there what Jer said and suppose just to reflect, for, reflecting on it. Um, I don't think I would have got through the last three months if it hadn't have been for the collaboration and support I got from Jer and our team in the ONMSD. And it's that type of collaboration and working together that made us stronger and be in a better position to be able to respond to the crisis um, in what has been a really Really, really difficult time for everybody so thank you our next webinar will be nursing and midwifery clinical leadership during COVID-19 sharing the learning from older person services and we look forward to you joining us for that webinar thank you